What do you think I did? Say it. If you did hurt him. On purpose. You can tell me. Hey guys, Pete here. This will be my Dexter New Blood episode 5 breakdown. I'm going to recap everything that happened in Runaway, and there was a lot, and then I'll let you know what I think about how things are coming together. The fifth episode worked as a nice follow-up that managed to crank things up another notch, and in the process brought back a beloved character. There's a lot to get into, so just a quick spoiler warning. If you're not caught up with New Blood through episode 5, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. The episode opens with Dexter home alone, looking at the straight razor and wondering what to do about it. He's going back and forth a lot and we see this through Deb. He thinks about whether he could have remembered what happened to Rita, as in going through it. Obviously he knows what happened to his mother, but Dexter's wondering if the experience created a dark passenger the same way it did for him. Deb reinforces that and she's advocating for helping him the right way, because what Harry did to him, teaching him to be a serial killer who can get away with it, that was child abuse. And from there he goes through all of the options. He knows it can be lonely, so he's able to talk himself into thinking that this is all really about helping his son. It just happens to have that added bonus of him getting to unburden himself and have that connection with someone else that accepts him as he is. The Deb side of things tries to guide him back towards reality and kind of underlines that side of the argument by saying, what are you going to do? Tell him that there are a hundred garbage bags of chopped up human beings at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. What do you think that would do to him? He'd turn out worse than you and you're a fucking monster. When Harrison comes home, he's actually in high spirits after the assembly, and Dexter's waiting to confront him about the razor. At first, he's upset that he looked through his things, but then he says that he only carries it for protection. Dexter asks him why he took it to school, because he's trying to find this open so that he can talk to him about what's going on, and not unsurprisingly, his son gets defensive about the question, especially the reference to him hearing Ethan's story saying, you believe some psycho school shooter over me. Dex pleads that he just wants to know the truth, he's not judging him. If he did hurt Ethan on purpose, then he can tell his father. He just thinks he's a kid that's going through something that he doesn't understand, and he wants to help him. And he caps it off saying, Harrison, you can trust me. And fittingly, his son says, why the fuck would I trust you? You're the one living a lie, Jim. And he's got a point. Then he goes outside to cool off, and Zack and Scott show up out of the blue, and they want to take him to a party. He finds out it's a kill list party so everyone inside thinks that they're alive because of him, which is a pretty good place to be in at a party. He talks to Audrey. She asks if he doesn't text her back so much anymore because of the podcast. And it's interesting because he asked her directly how they got the picture of Ethan's list, which she lets on that she took at the police station. From there, he starts to get wasted. A girl comes up and gives him an ecstasy pill, and he starts to spiral a bit, and then later we see Scott give him something, and after he takes it, Audrey notices that he's not doing well, and then he throws it out there that his father doesn't believe him, and he says that his dad's the liar, and that Jim Lindsay isn't even his real name, and then he passes out. She has to call 911, Logan arrives to administer Narcan, and realizes that it was Scott that gave him the drug, so he threatens to arrest him if he doesn't give up his dealer. Dexter gets called to the hospital where he finds out Harrison OD'd but is okay. It turns out he had black market pills that looked like Oxycontin but were really fentanyl. He learns from Logan that they came from a guy named Miles who is selling fake pills out of a dive bar in Moose Creek. And then they end up having words after Logan tells him that Harrison needs tough love. He says you think being the assistant wrestling coach makes you a parenting expert. And then on the way out, Deb tells him that it's all his fault. At home, he's on the way out. He asks if Harrison will be all right by himself and reminds him that his first appointment with his therapist is this afternoon. Then he tries to reassure him by saying that we're going to get through this. After he leaves, Harrison throws away his breakfast without eating it, including the plate. Dexter's on a mission to kill Miles. He goes to a shed and grabs a box of trash bags. He stops by at the vet to get syringes and ketamine and then goes looking for the dealer. 
He finds him at the bar. He makes an introduction as a buyer. He gets him outside, and then he's about to knock him out when the cops show up at the exact same time. He starts beating him up instead to cover up what was actually happening, and then Logan tells him he needs to follow them to the police station to fill out some forms. While he's there, he's trying to get information as Logan is questioning Miles. He does some really effective intimidation and gets the guy to name the person who makes the pills. And Dexter manages to get the name and address. He goes there and cases his house and Deb tries to talk him into leaving. She says, go home to Harrison, work on being a good dad. She says she's never seen him like this before. It's not about the code or feeding your urges. It's about vengeance. And this seems true. It's impulsive, but he's also telling himself that he's trying to do it for Harrison. He's able to sneak into the house, he gets the syringe ready, and while he's looking around, he finds the room where he makes the pills for proof. Then he sneaks up on him, hits him with the shot, and puts together a kill room. He wakes him up and talks to him about the people that he killed, and it turns out Jasper is a piece of work. Everything he says reinforces this idea that Dexter has that he's been alive for long enough. Once again, though, he is interrupted when Logan pulls up outside, so he has to change his kill. Instead of stabbing him and disposing of the body, he has to give him drugs, make it look like an OD, and then leave him in the pill room where the cops discover him. And he's not the only serial killer operating in the area. At the cabin, we get a better idea about Kurt's M.O. When he brings Chloe into the basement room, he tells her that she can stay as long as she likes, the meals are for free, and when she asks, can you actually be this nice, he tells her that he's been lucky in life to have more than he needs. He just humbly asks that she pays it forward. Eventually, she realizes she's locked in. She discovers the camera just like Lily did, and things are underway. Kurt goes over to the tavern and starts putting money in the jukebox, and we learn from Tess that he does this every couple of months. He comes in, acts like he owns the place, he plays Runaway, looking somewhat crazed while he's listening, and starts dancing. Then he asks her to dance with him, and it seems like this is something that goes along with his kill cycle. Later, as he's watching her on his laptop, she starts to try to offer him sex as a way to get out, and he quickly asks her to stop it, saying it's not what this is about. When she continues and starts to take off her bra, he slams the laptop closed, as if that ruins what he's getting out of this. Later, he has the hunting gear on, and then he buzzes open the door and tells her that she's free to go. She stops at the door and looks at the camera and says, make me. We saw that she had a broken piece of mirror, so now she's trying to get him to come into the room where she can slash him. And she is able to do that, but it's not very effective. He ends up dragging her outside, where she still won't run away. Eventually, she charges him, and in frustration, he has to shoot her that way, which really pisses him off. In his eyes, she's ruined everything. Angela and Molly decided to take a trip to New York when they learned that Matt's credit cards were used at a hotel in the city. When they get there, she's able to use her badge to persuade the desk clerk to tell them that Matt checked out. She wants to see the camera footage to confirm it's him, and after some convincing, he says that he'll have the IT guys pull the footage and that she can come back that night. And when they do come back and do that, they realize that it was someone else pretending to be him, which makes it seem likely that Kurt paid this person to use his cards to make it look like he was there. And I'm sure that they'll be asking him about it when they return to Iron Lake, but that's not really the big thing that happens while they're in New York. The other reason that Angela decided to go was because there was this law enforcement missing persons conference going on. And when they go into the first lecture, it's Angel Batista from the Miami PD. And he brings up the Bay Harbor butcher case. Molly brings up that she's done an episode about him. And if you didn't listen to it, they did put out one episode of her podcast as an extra after H is for Hero. And in that, she does reference the Bay Harbor butcher and the ice truck killer. But she tells Angela, Angela how they thought it was actually a cop at the department and can you imagine being right next to a serial killer for like years and having no idea which of course she can and is Angel talks about how they found the common connection with all his victims and that they all committed crimes they got away with. When you find that, it may turn out that one person is responsible for all the disappearances. Angela thinks this makes sense in relation to her case, and so she goes to talk to him at the bar. 
She gives him background on what's going on, and he essentially tells her that she just has to trust her gut. He does take a swing, he tries to hit on her, and she brings up her boyfriend. And it is a pretty funny exchange where he asks if he can handle you, and she says that he chops his own wood, and then Angel saying he wouldn't want to end up on the wrong end of an axe. In talking about sticking to your gut, he brings up Deb and the Trinity case, and it comes out that she died and her brother died too. It was all tragic tragic and that he left a son behind which he can't think of his name at first but as he's walking away he says Harrison and you see that it does get the wheels turning in her head which I suppose is supposed to indicate that she's putting it together from Harrison's last name of Harrison Morgan I'm not sure if that's ever been confirmed on screen that that's what they know him as but I don't see how we get where we get if that's not the case Speaking of Harrison, he's been out walking around. He's come to the conclusion that he's going to leave town and he runs into Kurt who offers to buy him a meal. As they're going into the truck stop, he notices the cut on Kurt's cheek and he explains that he got it in a hunting accident. They talk and he gives them some advice. Essentially, when you're angry at someone, you go and do something kind for them. And Harrison is not into the idea at first. It seems like he's made up his mind about Dexter. But then Kurt offers him a job gives him an application and when Harrison asks him why he's being so nice to him he says that he has potential he can see it and just pay it forward so there's the echo of that there which I guess is there to make you think that maybe he's going to be one of his victims but it doesn't seem to me that he fits his MO at all and we saw in this episode that he's very specific about how that all goes down. Things come to a close as Angela comes home and while she's talking to Audrey, she finds out that Harrison told her something weird right before he passed out. He told her that his dad's name wasn't Jim Lindsay. And again, we see Angela with the wheels turning inside of her head. Then she goes to the station, starts looking things up on the computer, and we see that she prints out the obituary of Dexter Morgan and it does have a picture of his face. We don't get to see what she does with it because the episode ends there. So this was another solid episode, another intense kind of cliffhanger ending, and it's pretty hard to say where things go from here. It's classic early season Dexter where it seems like he's caught and there's a recipe for mounting tension. It is what worked best for the Clyde Phillips seasons. There were a lot of things in this episode that felt like clues, or at least things that were supposed to stand out that we would remember later. Harrison's interest in the kill list, him seeing the cut on Kurt's face, the tension between Jim and Logan, which has kind of been building up a bit, but really reached a different level in this episode, and just how much knowledge Molly has on serial killers, in case you didn't pick up on that. I thought the buddy trip thing worked pretty well with those two characters. They kind of split everyone up in this episode, and I thought they worked pretty good together. Obviously, it was nice to see Angel make an appearance. And I have to say, I was rolling my eyes when he couldn't remember Harrison's name. Like, if they were going to leave it there, that would have been terrible. So I was actually pretty happy that they wrapped that all up, that she now knows that her boyfriend is Dexter Morgan, and I really don't know how that's going to play out. The kill of the week was okay. It's interesting to see him struggle through his decisions with Deb there as his counterweight. I don't think that New Blood needs to rely on kills of the week necessarily, but this one showed us how quickly he falls into his old ways. And that aspect of the show can be fun. Plus, there's a parallel with Harrison at the party too. They both fell off the wagon more or less and are able to jump right back in at full speed, but there are inherent risks from their stepping away. Harrison had immediate consequences, and Dexter had multiple close calls. Now we know absolutely that Kurt is the other serial killer in town. He's definitely responsible for some, if not all, of the girls on Angela's board. And you gotta imagine for Iris, too. He is absolutely cold-blooded. He shot Chloe in the face, straight in the face, in the most remorseless way possible. He was more upset that it wasted his chance to do his thing than he was about taking her life, that's for sure. His kill cycle's pretty weird and pretty specific. And I wonder now if he's going to have to speed things up to find somebody else to take Chloe's place because the cycle was interrupted. 
I'm curious as to where Pay It Forward came from. And like I said before, I don't think that Harrison's at any risk of being one of his victims, not from what we've seen so far. But it does seem like Kurt is putting out some effort to get close to Harrison, so we'll see where that goes. And I think that's a good place to leave things. I'll be doing a follow-up video in a couple of days again this week, so let me know in the comments what questions you have, what theories you're running with, and I'll break down the teaser and discuss those. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.